Last week was Vision Sunday, and so please uh, check, if you weren't here, check the recording online uh, and YouTube websites and SoundCloud and anywhere else that we, uh, we put that out there. But the emphasis was on to expect again. And we used Isaiah 54 as our scripture. And today what I want to do is just build on that and make it as practical as possible for our own lives. And so let's read that scripture uh, in Isaiah 54 verses 1 to 3. Sing, O barren woman, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. So enlarge the place of your tent, woman, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. And so we spoke about expecting and expecting again in a, in a season and a time where a lot of dreams and a lot of things are happening that are robbing us of expectation. And we talked specifically about what the church could do as we're moving forward in the next 12 months and beyond. And this is really, a, there's a model here for all churches and for our own personal lives. And so we spoke about that in the evening. We really tackled on how Hannah dealt with her barrenness and how we prayed and we broke barrenness and issues off people's lives because we wanted to deal with, uh, specifically last week, this area of barrenness, which is not just about the physical realm for a woman or a, a married couple, but it's a lack of expectation, vision, passion, where there's no drive anymore. There's no care beyond ourselves, so we don't want to give out. There's apathy in our lives. We're taking and we're no longer giving. And all we are typical Aussies, she'll be right, mate. That's a really barren statement. She'll be right, mate. We love it, but it's so, so, she'll be right, mate. I'm not going to go anywhere with that. I'm not going to do anything. She'll be right, mate. And so we accept the status quo and there is no future. So we need to understand, and we taught this last week, that what we expect is what we give birth to. You can't give birth to something you don't expect. So what you expect is what you give birth to. But this morning, let's take it to an, another place where we can apply these scriptures very practically into our future. So we read here that those who are barren have now been given a promise. So before we can go any further, we actually, uh, she's told to embrace the promises and not the curse. She's told this might be what the curse is, but I've got something more in store for you. I want you to start singing about what I've got in store for you, not about what's happened to you. So she had to embrace the promises and no longer the curse. Before we can do anything, we have to, have to, have to be saying, I want what you've got for me. I actually want to break out of where I am. I will sing in spite of how I feel. I'm going after this, I'm rejecting the curse, the negative and the past, so I can embrace the promise. We've got to have this attitude that this is a yes, that I want to dream again, that I can't hold on the past while embracing the future. If I want to dream again, you cannot dream while you're in the past. You're living here. And so how can you think about there when you are there? So I've got to reject that and move into the future. Remind, just a memory if you've had families and babies, but having babies shouldn't be a comparison or a competition. I've got 15 kids, you've only got two. I'm sure it happens somewhere, but in, in the scheme of things in God's plan, it's not about how many you've got, it's the fact that you've been blessed and you're so grateful. We don't compare. It's not a competition. Every marriage, parent, and family is different. So we're not here about comparing your journey with somebody else's journey, but what God is saying to you specifically today about your journey. It's embracing the blessing in each of us rather than comparing and competing with each of us. So you don't have to be physically capable to have kids. All right, so this morning we're talking beyond the physics uh, beyond the physical, I should say. We're talking about uh, something beyond the physical ability to have children. It's ability to say, I, I won't have a barren life. I shared last week when my uh, sister-in-law's mother passed away in the mid-80s and we went to the funeral a week ago that she had adopted her two daughters. 
and the story of how they adopted and what she and her husband had done in her lives. And they were the first Wycliffe missionary office managers in Africa. And he was in a wheelchair and she was, and they had no kids except for those they adopted. But what they achieved in their lives and what they produced and the offspring that are coming out of the offspring is generational, even though they were barren in the natural in a couple. So it's not about all of that. It's about something more. I think about Mother Teresa. She never had children of her own, but she has generations who inherited a blessed life. If you don't know who Mother Teresa is, which is quite surprising now, but there was another generation that won't know. But she was a Catholic missionary, uh, sorry, Catholic missionary nun, yeah, uh, who started the Missionaries of Charity in 133 countries where the congregation manages homes for people who are dying of AIDS and HIV, leprosy, tuberculosis. She runs soup kitchens, dispensaries, mobile clinics, children's and family counselling programs, as well as orphanages and schools all around the world, and she never had a child of her own. Was she barren? No. What about Florence Nightingale? Everybody should, or every nurse here should know who Florence Nightingale was. She was changed hospital practices and nursing standards so much that 150 years later after she lived on this planet, we are still using what her practices in our hospitals today. How many lives were saved because of what she introduced? Queen Elizabeth I, who started the Elizabethan, that's the way I say it, uh, era, established peace. She established the arts. That's where William Shakespeare, he, he was in that era. Uh, and her sovereign strengths while being known as a str- the Virgin Queen. She ruled for 44 years. Her era was so strong, integrous, uh, and, and when other nations struggled with wars and eternal strife, England thrived, but she was the Virgin Queen. Rosa Parks, who knows who Rosa Parks is? What a legend. Married but never had children. She refused to tolerate segregation on public transport when told to move so some white people could have her seat. Arrested and charged, she became a catalyst of change that eventually changed racial laws and society in the US. She lost her job but became a civil rights spokesman, an icon. She wasn't barren. So we're not talking about the physical this morning. We're talking about the plan for your life. See, God not only made a promise there, but he also moved on in that passage we read and instructs. See, he has a plan. So he's, our title this morning is Promise to Plan. So we don't just want a promise, we actually need a plan. And so he's saying, I've got a promise, now here's the plan. And so he says, and in our lives, we know that Jeremiah 29, 11, we all learned that as young people. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I have a plan. So God has thoughts and dreams for our, and ideas for our lives, like any good parent. We don't just give, have babies and go, yep, that's it, feed them and that's it. We actually have dreams for that church. We started off, we talked about it last week, that we are, before we plan a church, we're actually going to dream about having the children. We're preparing to have the children. And while we're, when we get married, we're talking about how many we're going to have and, and we, we don't have a lot of say in what they're going to look like. Well, we do because you're married, whoever you're married. But uh, um, I have not worked out how my grandkids are so good looking. I don't know what happened to my kids, but they just skipped a generation. <clears throat> Corner just raised a hand, yeah, yeah. I see the hand, you can get saved today, thank you. Okay. But you know, we, we plan and dream about them and we want the best for them. So we, we discipline them, we correct them, we guide them, we encourage them, we put them all things. God's the same with you and I. Oh, you're born again, Pfft, that's it, thank you, you're on your own. No, he's got a journey and a life for you that he wants. And in this passage of scripture, we actually see a way to have a plan to move forward in your life. And so he says, this is the first step, the first step of your plan. You want to have a plan to work out your life? You can write this down or you can just start to dream about it, go back over it, discuss in life groups, etc. But the first thing is, is enlarge the place of your tent. In other words, have a vision for your life. Because the tent, it's not the tent, it's the area that your tent is like, where your life is going to be. So what's going to happen around your life? Where is your life going to go? Where is it going to be planted? Where is it going to go? Have a vision. See, imagine how life is bigger than the small home I grew up in or the place where I was born into. Don't accept the status quo, but enlarge it to see more. Ask, and he says, ask God what the plan is. Have you ever done that? Ask God 
Is there a plan? If Jeremiah 29 says, I have a plan and ideas and thoughts, excuse me, Lord, can I have an insight into what that plan is so I can obey what you want for my life? And I'll give you some tips in a few moments. And so we ask God, that's what fasting is for, so we can get rid of all the extra noise so we can actually hear and be sensitive to what God may be saying. Now, let me remind you that I don't think God tells you all the details. So when you're building, a, uh, if you're building, on, a, I worked in uh, construction for many years, and uh, when you're building a, a large plant up north, say you're building the gas modules on, at, on some of the platforms, or you're building an iron ore plant, you actually get a plan, and you see the plan, you get some details and elevations and all that. But somewhere along the line, when you want to fabricate all that steel, someone, a, a, a drafter gets those details, or someone specializes in what they call shop drawings, they break down every part of that, and they show the details of every joint. This is what that joint, when that member goes to that member, this is what's going to happen. They're called shop drawings. And they are sent to the fabricator and all the welders in the fabrication shop. They will build, cut, weld, bolt, whatever it is that they've got to do to join and make it. But at the beginning, you don't see all of that. You've got to plan. And so don't expect God to tell you every detail. Because you know what I've discovered? If I knew every detail, I might have quit about 30 years ago. But I follow the plan. And so ask Him for a plan. What's he saying? Ask about your current 80 or so years you get on this plan, but also ask about, start to imagine, what's it like after 80 years? You know, your life is not limited to 80 years. It's eternal. So if you start to plan eternal, then you handle the 80 years quite easily because you're thinking about eternity without 80 years. Imagine eternity without any aches or pains. Oh, that feels good, and I know that it should. Yeah. What's your plan? Reverend Martin Luther King, simple Baptist pastor who refused to accept racial inequality. And he famously wrote and read, I have a dream. It's a great, great, great. You know that he actually wasn't going to say it. There's 250,000 people at this march or at this rally. And he got up and said, this is what's happened to our people over the years and, and gave his story. And it was, a, um, oh, I forgot her name, gospel singer shouts out, Reverend, Reverend King, share the dream. Share the dream. And so he stood back up. He only had 15 minutes after speaking. And he shared the dream. And that dream became a catalyst that changed so much of society. A dream was inside of him. And, you know, can we, shall we read a little bit of it? It's inspirational. I, I just, I, I can, and I'm white, so I, I, I get inspired. I love it. Um, I have a dream that one day every, that, uh, I have a dream that it's a dream deeply rooted in my American dream, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning. I have a dream that, uh, that my four little children will one day not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. I have a dream today. Anyway, I have a dream. This is, and he talks about hope. He talks about his faith. All the fuel of his dream. I have a dream. So you are a spirit with a body. Look after the body so as many can get to heaven as possible. Look after that. But the dream goes beyond now. It's how many I can take to eternity. When dreaming, think now and think eternal. Because that's how God thinks. God's not just thinking about you right now. See, God doesn't have time. He created time for us mortal beings while we're on this earth. God lives beyond time. He's currently in the past, He's in the present, and He's in the future all at the same time. Don't ask me to explain that to you because no one can explain time. Okay, who likes time movies? We all like it because we can't understand it and we won't love it and we fantasize about it, but it's crazy to try and understand. But God lives outside of time. And so he doesn't think about time. He does it for our benefit. But in his dreaming, it's beyond time. So we start to think beyond time. And that keeps us from being barren because we're looking for eternity. Have a dream of a life that isn't barren or now or in eternity. We not become another Martin Luther King. But we can do what God wants for our lives. So to have a vision is quickly, I just wrote these down because this is how I've lived my life and I haven't written it all down and have this big tablet and have all these amazing statements about my life. But it means I understand the need to think beyond now and beyond myself. First thing, I've got to get that. I've got to think now, beyond my, now and beyond myself. I've got to understand that. It's not about me right now. It's not about me. Secondly, I've got to seek the one who lives in the, be, in the now 
and beyond the now who created me. He's the one that has the plan and knows me. So I spend time with him. John 15 says, abide in him and him in us and we, him the vine, we the branches will produce the fruit. So my goal is to abide in him and from there the plan starts to unfold. So I rest, connect, believe and obey him. And the third thing I do is I know his plans by knowing him and the way he made me. It's a little bit crazy that we would Actually, there was, what's the movie Tom Hanks was on a desert island? Castaway. Do you remember he got a soccer ball? And what was the name of that? Wilson. Because it had the Wilson logo on it. And Wilson became a friend, but a pretty useless friend because he could never talk back. Because Wilson, the soccer ball, is a soccer ball. It's created for one thing. And I'm not going to bag soccer. Okay, don't stress about that. I'll spend too many, too many hours here. Um, it's a ball. It's for kicking. That's its function. Kick it through a goal once every six or so weeks. That's it. It's not a person. And so we get a function. We have got gifts and skills. He used it out of Kilda and he went, nearly went mad. But you and I have been created beyond a soccer ball. We have been given gifts and capabilities and skills that God put in each and every one of us. Romans 12 talks about God the Father puts in all of mankind gifts and skills. And so we need to understand. When we understand that, guess what? You're just halfway there on what your plan for your life is. If you can't sing, if you can't hold a note, I promise you, this is not a word from God. This is just it. You are not called to be a worship leader or a singer. You're not going to sell, though someone did sell, sell some records with, can leave, I can't live without you, many years ago on YouTube. Actually, YouTube makes bad things make a lot of money, doesn't it? But if you're not gifted, then that says something about your life. Where you are gifted, that says a lot about your life. So what has God made you? And that points you in your vision for your life. Romans, uh, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instructions. Someone without a revelation, understanding or vision, they actually wondered, asking the question, are people that could be in their 60s, what's the will of God for my life? I'm going to give you a scripture right at the end. What's the will of God? If you haven't worked it out now, I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's quite, actually quite simple. Look at the way he made you, the passions in your life and the gifts upon your life and follow those. So turn to him, seek him, get some revelation, ask what's in my, his heart to develop and how your gift is. Simple calling. It's not something rocket science and we're not talking about everybody becoming a prime minister. We're just all talking about doing what God made us to do. Don't stress about it. Stop worrying about how you're going to be the next prime minister. It'll work out if you abide in him and him and you. You will get a clear clarity on that. Vision is not about my success but about His working through me. The second thing it says here to do is stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. In other words, develop what you've got. Develop yourself. Build the tent. To build the life that you've got and develop it. Take the passion and the gifts and do something with them. 2 Peter 1.5 says this, In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. And there's a lot more after that. You can read it at your own leisure. But add to those things knowledge and build your knowledge and your giftings and your skills. Craft, someone used, craft the gifts that God has given you. Pastor Darlene Check, who for many years was the main worship leader uh, for Hillsong Music when it was really went, you know, took off and that and was po arguably one of the, the world's leading worship leaders. Up to, maybe she still does, but I remember hearing her well into her 40s, she was still taking, I'm not sure they were lessons, but she was still spending time with a vocal coach every week, spending money, improving the gift that God had given her improving what God had already given to her so that she could be the best that she could with what God had given her. Proverbs 1.5 says this, A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. A wise man will hear and increase 
in learning. They'll hear what I'm saying, go, why? What can I do with what I've got in my life to bring glory to God? In addition to just increasing your giftings and skills and enlarging your tent, work. In our society, sometimes it's a dirty word, fall out a dirty word. Work. To stretch the tent doesn't happen by itself. The woman has said, you go and stretch the tent. Don't pray that it gets stretched. You enlarge the tent. The Bible has countless verses, and half the Proverbs almost seems to be on that subject. Condemning laziness. Living a grace-filled, miraculous life is not a lazy life. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Psalm 78. This is one of my life scriptures. Psalm 78, 72. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. He didn't just have a good heart, spiritual heart. He worked at leading the the nation. And so we enlarge our capacity and our gifts that God has given us. And then the next part of that, Isaiah 54 says, do not spare. In other words, don't hold back. Don't let go. Don't spare mercy and generosity. And what I call that is having an attitude, a right attitude. So what is our attitude? Don't quit. Don't hold back. It's the attitude is the energy of the actions that we need to do. If we've got the wrong attitude, guess what our actions will look like? We have the right attitude. Check the actions out. It's smack in the middle of all of these passages here. It's revealing that it's the central theme, small in amount of letters or words, but big in its power. Attitude, as some people have said, is almost everything. It's a small key, I call it, that unlocks a big door or can close the door. Attitude is the way we think and comes from what we let into us. What goes into us will determine a lot of our attitude. We can be surrounded, attacked, pressured, but we don't have to let it in to affect our attitude. Jesus was fasting for 40 days. He's tired, weary. He's tempted, but he doesn't let it in, so it affects the attitude for the rest of his ministry. Victor E. Frankel, who was a Holocaust survivor and um, and an author, and I think a psychoanalyst or psychologist later on. She says the one thing that he learned when he was in the uh, camps in Germany in uh, World War II, the concentration camps, the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. You can't take that away from somebody. How I respond to what you do to me is my choice. Not your choice, not what you do to me, how I respond. So you, you can't. He says, the last of one's freedoms. We talk a lot about freedom. Oh, I want a freedom not to wear a mask. You know, hey, that's not freedom. That's something else. The last of one's freedom is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. You choose. I choose. We choose. The story goes that a journalist went onto the site of St. Paul's Cathedral somewhere around the 1600s uh, when the famous architect Sir Christopher Wren uh, was building it. And so this journalist went to ask the question, of some of the workers. So he asked three, what are they doing? What are you doing here? The first replied, I'm cutting stone for a couple of pennies a day. The next answered, I'm working 12 hours a day on this job. But the third said, I'm working with Sir Christopher Wren to construct London's greatest cathedrals and the house of the Lord. Three people doing the same job, three different attitudes. Attitude ter- determined who was the fulfilled person in that conversation. Who went the course and who had the bigger life? Attitude determined that. So what's our attitude? Is it victim or is it victor? A wounded soldier was visited by chaplains in hospital and he, who cared for him and went to visit and as they do and, and he commented to the man, he said, you have lost an arm in the great cause, he said. And the soldier said, no, sir. With a big smile, I didn't lose it, I gave it. That's the same attitude of Jesus. It's in the same way Jesus did not lose his life. They didn't murder him. He gave his life. He gave it purposefully. Philippians 2, if you read all of that, says he took an attitude or mindset to let go of his rights as God and come as a man to serve, die, and rise again. So we, the outsider, the sinner, may have a relationship with God. He gave it up so that we 
could have the relationship. In other words, attitude determined the fulfilling of the promise of salvation. If you don't need any other reason to have a right attitude, then there it is. Philippians says we are to take the attitude or the mindset of Jesus in the way we deal with stuff. Attitude determined the fulfilling of the promise of salvation. You want some other attitudes? There's a whole Bible full of them. If you read your Bible, you're going to find out about attitude. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or questioning. Philippians 2.5, take in the same attitude of Jesus. 1 Peter 5.5, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 17.20, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bone. James 4.10, humble yourself before God and He will exalt you. There's just a couple of them. And here's a beauty. Beauty, mate. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Oh, that sucks. Oh, rejoice. No, do you know what's going on? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, everything, not at good moments, not when you've said nice things, but in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for your life. Oh, I didn't know what the will of God was. Guess what? I didn't have to tell you. The Bible told you. It's all about your attitude. That's the real will of God. We sometimes focus on all the other stuff, but it's the attitude that determines the future. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for me. It's pretty cool, hey? I love it when the Bible just gives it black and white. I don't have to think about it. I just got to do it. And then the next step that he talks about this building this plan that's going to help you build a plan for your life is to lengthen your cords. And here we're talking about the relationships that we have. The connection cords that help the tent, your life, enlarge. The relationships that feed us and enlarge us. Ones that influence the vision in our lives. Ones that will help us grow our gifts and our purpose in our lives. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. <laughs> Is that pretty good? If you're married for more than five minutes, guess what? You learned that very quickly, didn't you? I'm super sharp. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fool, fools will be destroyed. Oh, the Bible is so black and white. You want to set the rest of your life, start reading Proverbs. A dose of Proverbs every day will set you up for life. It's good medicine for the soul. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companions of fools will be destroyed. Let me tell you, that is a really tough scripture because it's uncomfortable. Because when you walk with people wiser than you, you find, out how, you find out your weaknesses. You find out how insufficient you might have. But guess what? If you will persevere, you will actually grow. They will suck you for their, their lives will be like magnetic lives that will enlarge you if you walk with the wise. But if you hang around with fools, guess what? You become a fool. I, I, as I was preparing, I suddenly, out of the blue, remembered the ugly duckling story. Who knows that old parable, fable, whatever you want? Hey, tell me. Like, raise your hand. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Do you know the ugly duckling story? Oh, parents, if you don't know, you better go and tell your kids, Okay. It's a story of this ugly bird that hung out with ducks. And all its life, it thought it was this ugly duck. And everybody mocked it because it didn't look like the other ducks. But it was ugly and ugly. Until one day, it started to grow and realized it wasn't a duck when it looked at other, duck, other birds that were called swans. And what had happened was a swan had lost its parents and been mixing with the ducklings and it, while it was still young, it was ugly. But one day it discovered how beautiful it was. Gracious, powerful, and strong when it grew up. The thing is, that's a nice story. But in our lives, we don't necessarily automatically grow up to become beautiful. In fact, what often happens, we stay the ugly duckling if we don't make a choice to hang out with the right people. There's an old expression, I can't remember, somebody along the lines of, if you want to soar with eagles, go with eagles. If you want to sit with the chooks, hang out with peck with the chooks, and so on. So it's a truth in that. The Proverbs teaches us. Who have you approached to speak into your life, challenge you, and allow to ask the hard questions? Who is allowed to ask hard questions in your life? Squirming. No, don't ask me. Who asks the hard questions to challenge you? The Bible from chapter 2 right from the very beginning of Genesis. 
records God's men and women growing through relationships. Moses and Aaron, Moses and Joshua, Hannah and Elkanah, Naomi and Ruth, Ruth and Boaz, Saul and David, David and Jonathan, David and his mighty men, Elijah and the school of prophets, Elijah and Elijah, Jesus and his disciples, Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Silas. They all hung out, guess what? Encouraging, building and correcting one another. But we've got to, don't take it for granted. I think I shared last week, I have a gazebo that we put up at summer this year with the grandkids around and living it with us so that it would create a bit more shade. They've got a large area to play in. And I've noticed that it is uh, getting very frayed. The wind shakes it during the night and the sun beats on it. And I've been looking at the ropes and I've noticed these nylon ropes, all the outside is deteriorating and the inner core is all that's left. And if, you'd, if it kept, if keeps on doing what it's doing, it one day will snap. And those ropes will no longer hold the gazebo down. So the weariness of time, the beating of the air, the weariness of the winds blowing in our lives can often break things that we thought were unbreakable. And I say that is that make sure that in our relationships that we are looking after them. Do not take them for granted. Don't be get so familiar that you can be whatever you want to be and not expect that one day that familiarity may wear down the marriage. I want to speak to that in marriages. I have been around long enough to see marriages. How does someone 35 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years suddenly end a marriage? Could be a number of reasons. One of them will be familiarity and the wearing down and not making sure that you change the ropes, that you re reinforce the rope, that you do something with the cords in your life. Build the relationship. Don't just take them for granted. And in a church, that can be really, really dangerous because we get to love each other. Jesus says, love you. And we just go around, yes, yeah, smiley, 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 but finding behind the things that it's actually not working. So let's keep rebuilding, building. Keep the ropes fresh. And the last thing that he commands us to do, that he told this barren woman, that, you know, after celebrating and saying, I want the promises, the last thing is to strengthen your stakes. The things that hold the tent down, things that, uh, that the stakes that go into the ground, and these are your values. What values do you have in life? The holding down points, the things that aren't negotiable, but they determine your decisions. We make decisions every day based on inner values, things that we believe in, things that are important to us, that are un, uh, and we make them automatically. If we don't care about money, right? So if money's not important to us and we don't think anything beyond, and this is not a judgment, this is just a fact, and we don't think anything beyond tomorrow, guess what? We spend money every day without thinking about it. It's not a value. What might be a value? If you value coffee, guess what? Every morning you'll spend your five, six dollars on a coffee. Guess what? You've discovered. What, what tells me your values is where you spend your time, where you spend your money, and where your words go. And maybe a few other times. Things. things. So they determine our values. Because we may not say I've got any values, but we actually do because we make automatic decisions every day of our lives. We might not be deliberate, but we do have them. How we make our decisions. Is God first? What we spend our time and money on? Do we believe in the principle of sowing and reaping, tithing, loving and caring for others? How we respond to crisis? Do we respond or do we react? You know, it's all about me getting my way. How do we handle hurt? Is it love and forgiveness? These are all values, whether we have them in our lives or not. And there's more. And they reveal, see, these are more reveal what we hold most valuable in our lives. The Bible says, in Matthew, it says that, the condition of our heart comes from what we, the treasure that we have in our lives. What's that? What's a treasure? Value. So where we put our value will determine the condition of your heart. So where you spend your time, where you spend your company, what you look at and what you spend energy on and what you spend money on, they are treasures that will shape the condition of your heart. Proverbs says, guard, the, guard your heart. And this is a really powerful Above everything else, not as one of the things, but above everything else, guard your heart because out of the inner man comes all of wellspring of life, all of life's decisions, good or bad, will flow from them. So he said, and then Matt Jesus said, You can guard your heart how? By making sure that your treasure is the right treasure. What is your values will condition your heart. 1 Corinthians 13 13 says, What? Could be your core values. Right at the end, narrow it all down. 
It says this, three things will last forever. What are those three things? Who knows what they are? Okay, some of you read your Bible. Good on you. I'll get you a star afterwards, but that's great. What is it? Faith, hope, love. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You said, Amen. Go and read 1 Corinthians 13. Love is a toughie. My goodness, that's a tough gig, man. Some people I don't want to do that to. In fact, I want to do the opposite. Spend time meditating and making that your value. These are the values to live by. In other words, faith, following and trusting Jesus. Live with the attitude of confidence. That's what hope is. Attitude of confident expectation. Values to live by. Love unconditionally, practically. In other words, I'm going to give away more than I keep. I'm just going to pour out. That's called love. We can make this all, I'm going to wrap it up now. Thanks, mate. We can make this complex or simple. Your personality will determine this, that. Some of you, some of you are writing notes and you'll, you'll get a transcript out and you go, this is my purpose for my life. This is what I'm going to do. Others will be just building and building, building from the inside. But that's determined by your personality. But we can't deny that God told those who are barren, this is how you've got to live. It's not me saying it. This is the word of God. Hey, barren woman, if you want to get up, I want you to start to praise me. I want you to start to believe again. Then I want you to do this to your household, to your family, to your life. So you can feel, so you are ready to receive the generations that are going to follow. Plans don't just happen. They still need to get built. We've got a promise. We've got a plan, but we've got to build it. We've actually got to put stuff into practice. They don't just happen. I've, got lot, I've seen plans. I, in fact, there was a house that I was working on back in the 80s and uh, by the, owned by, it was going to be, if you remember the Rothwell, those who are old will remember the financial crisis that uh, shot down the merchant banker, Laurie Connell. And I was personally working on a $30 million house. The house alone was $30 million in the mid 80s, when, or the 80s when that happened. The plan was in, on our desks, and I still remember us looking at it and going, wow, this is phenomenal. And uh, yeah, and we're all, you know, it's got every bowling alleys, it's got everything, it had its own museum in it, it got everything. Bought nine blocks, super block, out in, uh, um, somewhere out in Dale Keefe, somewhere out there. And I remember us looking at it, you know what? And then one day, one day, a financial crisis hit. Remember, it was a Tuesday morning, got into work, and my boss said, shut the drawings up. He's his best mate, Laurie Connolly. There's no more money. And what was a plan never got built. And so we want to make sure we build the plan. We want to make sure that we're hearing from God, we're obeying His Word and cooperating, that we will build our plan. Don't go complex on this. Keep it simple. Just follow, abide in Him, follow the dream, enlarge your life, Get the right people around you. Have the right attitude. Make sure you've got the right values. It's not complex. We can make it into a big book and all that, but I'm not wanting to do that. I'm just wanting you to make sure you've got these things covered in what you're doing in your lives. Be deliberate about who you invite into your life. But I, can I just, because I know we have a mixed age group here, but what about the last years of your life? <laughs> you know, I'm retired now. I'm, I'm not, but you might say I'm retired. What plan do I have? What do I do with the next few years of my life? I have a friend who passed away actually uh, Christmas, two Christmases ago. His name was John Jeffrey. He came into our lives when we moved to Victoria back in 2003. He joined the church from Melbourne a month after we got there. And so we did life together. He was 10 or more, 15 years older than I was. And, uh, but he had retired. He had been a printer. He was not a pastor. He'd been a printer, owned a business, sold the business, managed the business, and then retired to country Victoria. Smart, planned. And then his retirement, what he did in his retirement years was more than what most people do in their whole life. He got involved in the church. He was building stuff in the buildings. He did all our guarding, him and his wife. He became an unofficial chaplain in a couple of primary schools. He then, there was a Kulamaton camp. When that went through crisis, he helped rebuild that place. He got on the board. He would go there and all these students that would come, he would teach those students. Every day of his life during his retirement years, almost up to the day he's died, he was doing something serving God. 
He still had a purpose. His age had changed. His location had changed. He still had a purpose. He still, his attitude was second to none. I remember asking, can you come on the board? He goes, yeah, I'm on the board, but I'm not going to say yes to everything you say. I go, that's okay. As long as your attitude's right, I'll say, I want to hear what you've got to say. And build it. He became, when I say about a relationship, he has become my mentor for the last few, when I get to that stage. This is how I'm going to finish. Not going to just run out of energy, but I'm going to finish well. So I speak to you today. So his legacy, John's legacy, is actually me and his kids. And for my future. How he did the last years as a man is what I want to do in my last years. With attitude. So as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I know this has been a very practical and you might say, oh, is that super spiro? Well, practical is super spiro. But the starting point for every person to know the plan, to get out of barrenness, is to know the God who will deliver you. And that needs us to surrender our past, our journey, and embrace the future with Jesus. And to do that, we need to repent of our sin, repent of our life, and say, I want Jesus to come into my life, to heal me, to forgive me, to become my Merciful God, kind God, corrective God to lead me. But we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. There comes a point we've got to make a decision. I'm going to live a life that is all about me and myself and my sin and now. Or I'm going to live a life that is for Jesus. That's not just for now, but for all of eternity. It's forever. And ever and ever with Jesus. So you meet Jesus today, it's not a one-hit wonder. It's not even for the time you're on this planet. You actually get him to be your friend, Lord and Savior forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And in fact, there's no time because he's not in time. So if that is you this morning, God will be speaking to you to get your life in order with him, to surrender to him. I want to pray with you. I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to pray with you. I've got people that are looking out for you. If that is you this morning, and you know you need to surrender to God, to give up the past and let go and to move forward, I need to surrender right now to Jesus. As Christians are praying for you, would you just lift your hand and say, I choose today to let go of my old life and to embrace a life following Jesus. I will repent of my sin and embrace Jesus. Anybody in this place today making that decision, maybe you've made it in the past and you know you're not walking with God. Maybe you're not sure, but you know today I've got to make it right. Anybody in this room, maybe you brought somebody. It's time to whisper, is it you God's speaking to? Anybody across this room today, don't leave this place without meeting Jesus Christ and making Him your Lord and Savior. Anybody from young to old, please, please make this moment. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, All I know is you've got now to make that decision. Anybody in this room? Father, you see the hearts and minds of every single person. I thank you for them. I thank you for every person. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this house. I thank you, Father. If there's anybody that doesn't know you, you're not going to let go of them. You're going to keep talking. Even during coffee time, whatever we do after this service and during this day and the weeks ahead, I pray, keep drawing them. To you I pray, Holy Ghost. Father, we open our hearts now to become bigger, to no longer be small-minded and small-thinking and with it up and barren, but to, to ask you, what have you got in store? Where, how can I abide in you and produce fruit? I pray that over every person here in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I'm going to actually ask the band. We're going to sing that last song we sung. I speak to you. But I'll, can I read the rest of a scripture to you while they're coming up? And it's 2 Peter one five. I read part of it. I want to finish it off for you. It says this, one, 2 Peter 1, verse 5 to 11. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. Add to knowledge self-control. Discipline, 
Self-control with patient endurance. We talk about weariness. And patient endurance with a godly living. And godliness with what? Brotherly, brotherly affection or love. And brotherly affection, affection with love for everyone. There's a pathway that will then take you onto a journey of fulfilling significance for God. Because the next verse in verse 8 says, The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus. But those who fail to develop in this way, don't allow the full development to take place, they are short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sin. There's a pathway that's found in the barren woman story and is here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. To allow God to work for you. Allow Him to minister you and you follow the pathway to produce and to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Hey, well done, good and faithful servant. 